Matthew chapter 27, verse 1. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. And so they had taken Jesus in the night time. And so this is happening all through the night. The rest of Israel is sleeping. They've come privately by stealth to arrest him because they know that if they did it publicly in front of the people, the people would have protested and would have fought against him and stopped it from happening. So they did it very secretively, very stealthily. And so the council of these Pharisees and scribes and religious chief priests and leaders of Israel, they had got together in the night that brought Jesus to the high priest who was like the highest governing authority of Jewish people. And they'd presented their case before him. Jesus had blasphemed to him, saying that he was God. And this was punishable by death. They knew that they had him on that charge. Then there was the charge against the Romans, which he, he said that he would destroy the temple. There was two witnesses that would corroborate that in a court of law against Jesus. And so they had this charge that they were going to bring against him as well because destroying the temple actually was property of Rome. Rome had claimed Israel and its property. And so destroying Roman property is an act of defiance and rebellion against Rome. And this is also punishable of death. So they got Jesus now on two criminal charges that are both punishable of death, one under Roman law, one under Jewish law. So now they're going to take these charges and this case and present it to Pontius Pilate, who is the governor of Jerusalem and Israel, and he has the power to pardon Jesus or to convict him and to execute judgment against him, which would be crucifixion. And this is all taking place early in the morning. Verse 3, Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. So Judas realizes what he's done. He somewhat comes to his senses and he realizes they've taken Jesus. They're going to kill him. Maybe he didn't realize it would go that far or maybe he did. But either way, he's regretting what he's done. He feels bad about it and he goes and he hangs himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed them. So even this was prophesied about. This is all a part of God's plan. And here the religious people, they think that they being so virtuous and righteous by doing the right thing. They know that it's blood money. It's evil money. And so they don't want to put it into the temple. They go by the field. They know that they've done the wrong thing. But here they're still trying to act on the outside like they're doing the right thing. And these are evil people. They don't care about God. They're just trying to appear righteous on the outside. But on the inside, their hearts are corrupt. And if they knew God, they would never have done this to Jesus. The fact that they were shows they didn't know God. And here they were about to get Jesus convicted and crucified. Verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. So here all these chief priests were bringing all these accusations to the governor against Jesus. And the governor has the power to pardon Jesus or to punish him. And Jesus doesn't even try to defend himself. The only thing he answers is when Pontius Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And in one sense, Jesus is actually defying Rome when he claims to be the king of the Jews because Rome had appointed Herod as the king of the Jews and ultimately the emperor is the king of the Jews. And so Jesus, by saying I'm the king of the Jews, is also a little bit defiant against Rome. But Pontius Pilate knows 
that this Jesus is someone special. I'm sure he would have heard about him, heard about the miracles, heard about the stories, even back when he was born and all the things that happened around then. There would have been stories about Jesus. Jesus was famous throughout all of Israel. So Pilate would have heard about him. And actually, I believe he was a little bit worried if this was the Son of God. And he was trying to work out whether he was or not. But here, Pilate was being pressured by these chief priests to prosecute Jesus and to convict him and find him guilty. And so the governor who represented Rome, he wanted peace in Israel and in Jerusalem. It was always better for business. It was better for maintaining control that you have peace and you, you get along and you work well with the people. And so he was always trying to maintain good relationships. And a part of that was working with the chief priests and the elders of the people. The chief priests would help the people to be more compliant with Rome. So Pilate knew that he had to appease or satisfy these chief priests. They, they couldn't tell him what to do and control him, but there was this working together. And right now they were putting a lot of pressure on him. So even if he had his doubts, he wouldn't just say, no, I'm not going to do this. He's trying to work with them. And so he's trying to figure out what's going on here. And so when Jesus didn't defend himself against any of the charges, Pilate was greatly amazed. And even that was prophesied hundreds of years ago, that the sheep is silent before the slaughterer. Verse 15, now at the feast, that is the Passover feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. So this is about maintaining good relations with the people. And that was some kind of agreement that they had, that every time it was Passover, he would release from prison someone that the crowd wanted. And this helped to keep relations good. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. So Pilate here actually has some insight. I think he suspects that Jesus is innocent and that he actually is the rightful king of the Jews and possibly even the son of God. I don't know if he'd go that far in believing that. And he perceives that these religious people were threatened by Jesus and they didn't like the fact that the crowds were following him and turning away from them. And he could see that happening. And, he, and so he knew that these religious people were jealous of Jesus. They were envious of him. And that is why they wanted to get rid of him. Not because he's guilty, but because he's taking power away from them. So he gives the religious chief priest the option, release Barabbas or release Jesus. Barabbas was a criminal. He was a dissident. He, he led a rebellion against Rome, and so he was captured. And in other places, it says he was a murderer. He was a thief. So he was a bad guy. And so here, these religious people who pride themselves on being holy and keeping the law and doing all the right things, you would think that they would want to condemn someone who is guilty and release someone who is innocent. But no, they want to condemn Jesus, who is innocent, and they want to release Barabbas, who is guilty. They want to set him free. And it just shows their hypocrisy. Pilate can see through it. And then he has some other insight here from his wife. Verse 19, Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Obviously, it was a very troubling dream. I'm sure it was from God. And so through this dream, she just knew that Jesus was a righteous man. He was a good man. And that if you were to convict him, that would be the wrong thing to do. And so she was advising her husband about these things. And so Pilate had to take all of this into account. And so Pilate was in a bit of a predicament. I think in his heart, he knew Jesus was a good man, innocent, righteous man, possibly even the king of the Jews, possibly even the son of God. And yet he was being pressured by the religious people to, to crucify him. So he was in a very difficult position. He was sitting on the judgment seat about to pass judgment. Verse 20. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. Verse 24, So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, 
saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself. In other words, he knew that Jesus was innocent and yet he was about to put him to death unjustly. And so he takes the water and he washes his hand, basically saying, the blood is not on my hands. Let it be on your hands. In verse 25, and all the people answered, his blood be on us. And on our children. I wonder if they even realized what they were saying. Then he released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. And so even though he washed his hands, perhaps he believed Jesus was innocent. It also shows that he wasn't actually a good hearted man. He was still willing to condemn Jesus the innocent. And then he actually had him scourged. And that is the 40 lashes minus one, you know, the 39 lashes with the cat of nine tails, that, that whip that had bones sewn into it and little metal fragments so that when it hit you, it actually ripped off chunks. And so they, they would have whipped Jesus's back and ripped off chunks and he would have been bleeding badly from his back. They would have been almost artists at this. So they would have made sure not to hit any arteries with the whip in the arms or the neck. Otherwise, he would have just bled out in a few minutes. So, but they, they didn't hit the arteries. They scourged his back. He would have been bleeding quite badly from his back. Absolute agony. And then after the scourging, Pilate delivers Jesus to be crucified. And so no matter how much he tried to wash his hands of this, he was still guilty of ordering the crucifixion of Christ. Imagine if you were that guy. Verse 27 then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him. So if you look it up, the battalion actually means around about 600 soldiers. These were the soldiers that guarded the governor and the headquarters of the governor. So, they, so 600 soldiers take Jesus into their headquarters and so they would have surrounded him now. And listen to what happens. Listen to the humiliation that Jesus had to endure. And often we actually miss this part of the story. But what really made it stand out for me is when I understood battalion means 600. And so 600 soldiers surround Jesus and they start to humiliate him and mock him. And when I think about this, I think, how do we handle humiliation in life? Often our pride, our ego gets offended and we want to react and we want to get angry and retaliate. How dare you humiliate me? Don't you know who I am? And we get bitter and we get angry. But listen to how Jesus handled this incredible humiliation. And the reason he was able to handle it because he was so secure. He had nothing to prove. He knew that he was the son of God. He knew that he was from God. He knew that he had power and authority. He knew his identity. He knew that he could call 12 legions of angels. And yet he didn't do that. He just stayed secure and he endured the humiliation. He didn't get into the flesh to defend himself and to fight back against the humiliation. He just took it. Humiliation is something that we'll face, you know, especially for being a Christian, we'll be persecuted. People will humiliate us. You know, how do we handle that? Do we react in the flesh? Do we react in pride? Do we go on the attack or do we just take it? Are we just humble? We got nothing to prove. We don't have to fight back. We can actually handle humiliation. So just imagine Jesus in the center and 600 soldiers surrounding him and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. So they took his clothes off. So he was naked in front of them. That's humiliating. And then they put a scarlet robe on him, this, this little purple robe on him, because that's supposed to be like royalty and twisting together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. Could, I mean, could you imagine 600 soldiers is all surrounding you, looking at you, staring at you, scorning you, mocking you, pretending to bow down and worship him as the king, even though it's all a mockery. And they would have been laughing at him. Imagine 600 soldiers laughing at you. It's a very intimidating position. You've got these powerful soldiers and you are naked. You've got this little purple cloth on you and this crown of thorns, you know, beat into his head. He would have been bleeding from his head. And they gave him this stick, this reed as some kind of staff. And then they grabbed the reed and they beating him with it and they mocking him and they spitting on him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. So just an incredibly humiliating situation. Verse 32. 
As they went out, they found a man of the Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. Some people say that the gall was, you know, bitter. It was possibly myrrh, which actually has numbing agents in it. And so it was a small mercy gesture. You could actually drink it and possibly it would help to numb some of the pain. But Jesus wanted to drink the full cup of the wrath of God. And so there was no numbing any pain and getting out of it. He endured every part of the cup of wrath that he was to drink. And this wine mixed with gall wasn't his cup to drink. Verse 35, and when they had crucified him, wow, it just says it so quickly in one sentence, but that's, that's where they nailed the nails into his hands and into his feet and hoisted him up on the cross, bleeding, suffering in agony for everyone to see. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. So his clothing, his garments were actually really good garments, were probably quite expensive garments. And so they kind of cast lots, sort of gambled to see who would win them. And even this was prophesied about in scripture. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So that was the charge against him that he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. And so using that phrase was actually mocking him. And they knew that that was the very charge that convicted him. And so they were saying, you know, if you're the son of God, then come down off the cross. They didn't even realize no, he was the son of God and he was supposed to die on the cross. That's exactly where he was supposed to be. But they were too blind to see that. Verse 41. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. I mean, you can just see how happy they were. They had finally crucified him. They were just salivating and happy. And now they were mocking him. And the funny thing is, they thought that they were winning. But they didn't realize this was actually the plan of God. This is what was going to cause Jesus to come into his kingdom and to bring many others with them. And that, it just shows how unbelieving and hard-hearted they were. How callous. Just standing there mocking Jesus who's suffering. He's dying on the cross. Literally dying and they're there just mocking him. I mean, who does that? That is just such cruelty. It's such evil. It shows that they had a murderous spirit in them. They didn't carry the heart of God and the love of God. You know, if they did, they would have fulfilled the law, but they were under the law and super religious. And this was the terrible effects of people that are religious trying to live under the law. You end up becoming so murderous. And then verse 44, and the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now we know from other gospels that one of the robbers actually said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And he didn't have the chance to get baptized in water. He just believed in Jesus. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Absolutely awesome. Verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. That's from noon. 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. There was darkness that came over the whole land. So there's not normally supposed to be darkness at that time, but now there was darkness that came over the land. So this is a supernatural event that is happening now. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is the first sentence out of Psalm chapter 22, which talks about the Christ and the crucifixion. And so people that would have heard, they would have known he was alluding to that psalm. And in that psalm, it talks about, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I know a lot of people say, no, you know, God never forsook 
Jesus. God never turned his face away from Jesus. Um, but I actually believe that he did in this moment because this perhaps this was the very moment where, this, where Jesus took up the sin of the world, all the sin of mankind, and, and, and the wrath of God was on Jesus. And so God the Father couldn't look at Jesus with all of that sin, all the sin of mankind. God had to look away. And so in that moment, Jesus is saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that is not a bad thing. That is not bad theology. That actually fits well with the whole gospel. Jesus took the sin of the world on himself and the father had to look away because he couldn't look upon that sin. And he judged that sin and he punished that sin. Okay. And so Jesus took that on himself so that when we have faith and are born again in Christ, God will never, ever look away from us. Even if we sin and mess up, the Father will never, ever look away from us because Jesus took it on himself and the Father had to look away from Jesus. And so he'll never look away from us. And I don't think that that's weird. I think that fits perfectly into the gospel. This is the first and only time that the Father looked away from the Son because after all of this, you know, Jesus had paid for the sins of man. He was resurrected. He ascended into the highest place, sat down on the throne. He has and always will have the full attention and the gaze of the Father on him. And we are in Christ and we always have the gaze of the Father upon us. He will never, ever look away from Jesus again. And he will never, ever look away from us. And so actually, that's a wonderful part of the gospel. Verse 47. And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. So these were things that were part of prophecy. Jewish people believed in some of the prophecies that Elijah would come as the Messiah is coming. And so in their minds, they thought maybe he's calling out to Elijah. So they gave him some wine, some sour wine to drink. This was different to the gall. This wasn't to numb the pain. This was just a small sip of sour wine. And so he's probably struggling to talk at this point. And so perhaps he took some wine just to help loosen up his mouth so that he can actually utter the words, it is finished and into your hands I commit my spirit. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. So perhaps that loud cry was actually the point when he died, or perhaps it was saying, it is finished, and into your hands I commit my spirit. Anyway, he died, and his spirit, the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of Christ, left his body. All right, verse 51, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So that was a miracle, a supernatural thing. That was a very thick curtain, big curtain, Human beings couldn't just rip it. That was ripped by God from top to bottom, signifying that the way into the presence of God has been opened up. And it was opened up through his body. His body was like the veil that was torn for us. And his blood was shed for us to open up the way into the Holy of Holies. And so now coming into the presence of God, coming before the throne of God, we don't have to come scared and fearful of judgment. That We can come with boldness because he has opened up the way by his blood. And we draw near through the blood of Jesus. And so this is quite deep stuff. But now through Christ's body, and he actually is the temple. His body is the temple that was opened up for us so that the way could be made open. But he is the fulfillment of the temple. The temple was just a shadow and Christ is the fulfillment. And now in Christ, we become the temple of God. The Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit no longer dwells in buildings, but he dwells in us who are the temple of God. And the reason the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can dwell in us is because the blood of Jesus has made us holy. And then reading on, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. So you can just read over these things sometimes and just miss the fact that this was happening. But actually there was supernatural darkness over the land from 12 to 3 o'clock when Jesus died. And so as he died, the darkness would have ended. The lights would have come back on. And all of a sudden there was this big earthquake. The ground was shaking and rocks were splitting open. And the curtain in the temple split. I mean, that would have been such a loud sound. People would have heard it for miles around. And then 52, the tombs also were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection... They went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, I believe that that happened 
All of this happened because I believe the Bible. And you can be a skeptic and try to say it didn't happen. That's fine. You can just be an un, you can just be an unbelief. But I, I have faith. I believe the Bible, and I believe the words of Jesus, and I believe these accounts. And I believe many would have witnessed these things. And so when they wrote about it, there would have been people at the time who would have said, yeah, no, we, we saw we saw those people. So we can concur that this is accurate. But if no one ever saw, but if no one experienced any of these things, didn't see any of the resurrected Old Testament saints and, and, and the Bible came out claiming that all these things happened, people would have shut it down, say, this is false. This is rubbish. Throw it away. But obviously it was accurate and it was true and people could testify and corroborate the story so i believe it's true and here are a lot of old testament saints being raised from the dead and the bible says that when jesus died he descended into the lower earthly depths that is paradise that is abraham's side that is the place where all the righteous dead before christ before the cross had to go when they died and so jesus said to the thief today you'll be with me in paradise and that was in heaven that was the waiting place where the departed souls of the unrighteous dead had to wait for the Messiah to come and shed his blood to release them from that captivity so that they could then also go into heaven and enter into heaven. So Ephesians chapter 4 says that when he died, he descended into this place and then he released those from captivity. And when he ascended on high into heaven, he took those captives with him into heaven. And that is all the Old Testament saints, including the thief on the cross, who was now able to enter into heaven because the perfect blood was shed. Now people could be born again because of the resurrection. We could be raised to new life in Christ and enter into heaven. So Christ descended and he revealed himself to all those Old Testament saints. Hey, I'm here. The blood's been offered. And then when he rose from the dead, all of them came with and before he went to heaven, they were hanging out in Jerusalem. I mean, this is this sounds so far-fetched, but I just, it's the truth. I believe in a God of miracles. I believe in the supernatural. And this is the gospel. All those Old Testament saints had risen with Christ. And it says they appeared to many in Jerusalem. So perhaps Abraham, King David, Samson, you know, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, 12 tribes of Israel, all just walking around. And it would have been amazing. Just more signs and proof and evidence that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. He was who he said he was. He wasn't some liar. He wasn't some lunatic. He was Lord, exactly who he claimed to be. And this was proofed and evidence with many signs and wonders and miracles that many people witness and can testify about. So you can deny Christ all you want, but there are many evidences and proofs that prove him to be true. Verse 54, when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the son of God. I mean, these were the guys who crucified him. They had mocked him. They had whipped him. They had hammered the nails into his hands and his feet. And they thought they were just killing another criminal. And now they finally realize they've just killed the son of God. And they were filled with awe. Perhaps fear at the realization of what they had just done. They just killed the Son of God. And in other Gospels, it says that they tore their clothes and they beat their chest, which was regret and remorse and sorrow for what they had done. And they, they left. They went away knowing what they had done. They had crucified the Christ. And, and you know, one minute they were totally okay doing that. The next minute, all these signs and wonders are happening. It's dark. There's an earthquake. As Christ dies and they realize this isn't just some accident, coincidence. This is God shaking the earth. This is supernatural events. They knew this was the son of God and we just crucified him. So imagine being those guys. They became believers, but unfortunately it was in a bit of a negative sense. Verse 55, there were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So here are these faithful women standing there watching him die, perhaps standing at a distance to give him his dignity, because he would have most likely been crucified naked. But they were faithful followers of him all the way to the end. And I believe they knew he was the son of God. And I believe they knew he was going to rise from the dead. And so I believe them being there, 
They were watching it happen, but I truly believe they had faith that he was going to rise from the dead. And so on the first day of the week, on the Sunday, which was when he was supposed to rise, they knew that they actually came to the tomb because they were expecting him to rise. Amazingly, the women were the only ones who had faith and expected him to rise from the dead because they believed his words. And they had to go and tell the disciples he's risen from the dead. And only then did they come to the tomb. Verse 57, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. Did you catch that? Did you catch what I just read? It says there was a rich man who was a disciple of Christ. It was possible to be rich and also be a disciple of Christ. Christ doesn't, didn't expect all rich people to sell everything they had and follow him and give up all, all their money and follow him. It's just those that money was their God. He said to them, you need to give up money and come follow me. But there were many rich people who weren't worshiping and following money. When Jesus came, they followed him. And so Jesus said it is really hard for the rich to enter the kingdom because often the rich were proud and they trusted in their wealth. It was like a self-righteousness. They didn't feel they had a need for Jesus because they were self-made. And so Jesus said it's very hard for the rich to enter into the kingdom. It's much easier for the poor because they generally more humble and dependent. But he didn't say it's impossible for all rich people to enter into heaven. And here, clearly, this rich man had heard of Jesus and had ended up following Jesus and believing in him. So it's wonderful. And then he honored Jesus by coming to bury him in a tomb, to honor his body. And what he did for Jesus was actually an amazing, wonderful thing. Verse 58, he went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. Verse 62. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how this imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. So once again, the Pharisees are in damage control. They knew that he had said he's going to rise again. So they said to Pilate, yes, this is going to happen. Let's seal the tomb so the disciples can't steal the body and then pretend he rose from the dead. I think actually they were fearful that he was going to rise from the dead because I do believe that they actually believed he was the son of God because Jesus tells the parable about the tenants that the master left in control of the vineyard and then he sent servants to those tenants to collect the fruit but they killed the servants that was all the prophets that came to Israel and these evil leaders killed them and then Jesus says but then the master sent his own son and the the tenant said ha ah, look this is the son let's kill him and take his inheritance and i believe in that Jesus was saying the tenants these pharisees these leaders of Israel they recognized and knew that Jesus was from God, that was the son of God. And they knew that, but they thought, let's kill him so that we can take his inheritance. And so I believe the Pharisees believed that Jesus was the son and they killed him on purpose so that Israel wouldn't follow after him, but would continue to follow after them. And so I think they thought he was going to rise from the dead. And they probably thought, let's seal up the tomb so he can't get out when he rises from the dead and then he'll die again. And then it'll still look as though he never rose from the dead. And so whether they believe that or not, Christ's tomb was sealed with a big rock and they put a Roman seal on it. So if anyone tried to break that seal and enter, it would be breaking Roman law. And, you know, you could possibly be executed for that. But this is all part of the plan because we know what is about to happen. <laughs>